Good morning, everyone. It's good to see everybody that's gotten out today. We have a good number. We had a good number at first service, but we always uh, want you to remember and understand that we want you to choose your method of, of worshiping the Lord. We hope you'll worship in one way or the other, but if, if uh, you choose to wear the mask and want to come to first service, we'd like for you to do that if you are... Um, optional at this service but we are glad that you are with us uh, whichever way you choose or live stream or Facebook it's a difficult time but we're working our way through it so we're happy that you are listening or worshiping uh, with us in whatever means today um, let's remember though that we have a lot to be thankful for even though we kind of uh, dwell on the negative now, but we all have a lot to be thankful for. So for the next hour, let's all try to lay aside the cares of this world and let's participate as we worship our Lord together. <clears throat> this morning, Jared Morgan will be leading our singing. Corey, Phillip, uh, Corey Westerfield, at the appropriate time, will lead our prayer. Uh, Chris Gunn will conduct our Lord's Supper devotional and Brad Hall will have our scripture reading and Mark Ray will have our lesson. So let's begin as we began our worship today by reading a scripture, a very common scripture that you've all heard and has been uh, made into a song. Numbers 6, 24 through 26 says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Jerry. We'll be singing some... Uh
Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful to be able to be here this morning. We're thankful to be able to gather as a group of your people and to be able to worship together and to strengthen each other, to edify each other, uh, and to be able to do that, Father, without uh, worry of, of persecution and things of that nature, Father. We're grateful that you saw fit, Father, to send your son here not only to die for our sins, but to establish your church and to establish the, the ways, Father, in which we are to worship you. And we pray that we will do that in a spirit that is true. And uh, Father, we simply just want to express our adoration for you, for all that you do for us, and for the beauty of this world that you've created. As Bonnie mentioned, sometimes we focus so much on the negative, but there is so much positive, Father, that we have in our lives. And we know that you are to be thanked for that and that you are the one that blesses us. Father, we confess that we often are not the people that you want us to be, that we fall short and we don't do the things that you want us to do. We pray that you'll just give us the strength that we need to be able to overcome those things. That we'll, that we'll strive each day to just do a little bit better and to try to be the kind of people that you want us to be that will treat others the way that you'd want us to treat them. Father, we're thankful for all the many blessings uh, that you've given to us in our lives, both spiritual and material. And uh, we're, we're grateful, Father, especially during this time of the year, we often gather with our families and we're thankful for their safe travels. And we pray that they'll have safe travels at, when they return home. Father, we're thankful for those that uh, have been uh, sick, that are able to be here with us today. And we pray that you'll continue to give them healing, uh, that you'll continue to be with them and those that are caring for them, to give, that you'll give them strength um, as they continue to uh, try to heal and, and as they continue to seek treatments. Father, we're mindful of those that have experienced loss <clears throat> uh, recently, Father, and we pray that you'll give them also a spirit of strength and a spirit of peace. And Father, help them to lean on us, lean on their families, lean on this as their Christian family, and help us to be of, a, of help to them. Father, we ask that you would continue to bless us, continue to be with us as we go through this service. And thank you again, most of all, for your son who died for us on the cross and whose blood forgives us of our sins and help us to, to walk in a way that is worthy of you, Father. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.
Nathan started off his sermon last week talking about the movie Inside Out. He talked about the two emotions, joy and sadness, and how they were trying to figure out how to deal with each other. And isn't that what we have right here? Those same two emotions, joy and sadness, and us trying to figure out how to deal with, with both of them. See, we're only human. And we see life as joy and death as sadness. And this seems to be that all rolled up into one. Two scriptures, back-to-back -back verses, demonstrate this. Romans 5, 8, and 9. But God demonstrates his love towards us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. See, Christ died, sadness, we will be saved, joy. Romans 6, 3 through 4, Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Again, his death, sadness, but for us, a new life, joy. Let us pray. God, we come to you this, this morning, gathered here, to take this communion. Take this bread, which represents your son's body. In Jesus' name, amen. God, we come to you again at this time, mindful of the sacrifice for us and that this cup, which represents his blood, shed for us, that we may have life. In Jesus' name, amen. Each week at this time, we also have another prayer, thanking God for the blessings that we have. And as we have made the change, the boxes in the back are made available for you to put your contribution in. Let's pray. God, we come before you again this morning, so thankful for the many blessings that we have, many that we take for granted, many that we don't even realize. We ask that you help us to see those and to see your hand in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.
be reading from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from all Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place in, while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth to, into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. You may be seated. Good morning. It is good to see everybody here today. We have a good number of folks here. Glad that you're able to be with us. We have this opportunity to worship together. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, a passage which was just read for us. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. I want to thank Nathan for uh, preaching for me last week. He did an excellent, wonderful job, and I am highly or very appreciative of that. I'm also appreciative of our visual audio crew. Uh, they have installed a new camera, and if you look back there, it looks like R2-D2. I thought it was Special K, but they call it 4K. I don't know. But um, it's, it's one of those that works really well, and they're doing a lot of neat stuff as far as how the audiovisual stuff will work. And so uh, in that crew, you're looking at Lori and Scott. You're looking at Mike and you're looking at a lot of other people, Danny, and other people who are working with it. And I appreciate them. I appreciate Philip working with the radio and all the people doing sound and everything else. It's a, a good work that they're doing. There's a lot of expertise that goes with that. I also want to thank Sean and Nathan for the last Wednesday night class that they did. If you look on Facebook, we had 1,200 views of our Wednesday night class so far. And this next week, uh, it's going to be Nathan and Bill Morgan. So be sure to watch that. They're going to talk about the history of the church and families, the role of families in working with the church. So it would be an interesting class to be a part of, and that will be 6.30 on Wednesday night. Now, in our lesson, as we look here in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, we're going to talk about journeying or for the holidays or traveling through the holidays. Christmas has always been one of my favorite holidays. And of course, Thanksgiving is as well. Now, of course, I love to eat. That's a big part of Thanksgiving. And I love getting stuff and giving stuff. That's a big part of Christmas. But since I've grown older, out of high school and being away from home, what I've always enjoyed about the holidays is it's an opportunity to get back with family. And maybe you're like me. I used to tell my parents I love the smell of home. And that always made them look at me weird because they didn't want their house to smell like anything. But you know what I mean. When you go back to the old home place, you get back to where you grew up, there's a, a feeling, a smell, an atmosphere that feels good to be there. When your family lives away, it feels good to, for all of us to be together. Now, with the rules this year, it's a little bit harder to travel. It's dangerous. And so you have to be careful about those sort of things. But many people will be traveling back and forth and things such as that. And so I want us to think about that and think about how that relates to what we read of here in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. As we consider this, <clears throat> go ahead and think about Joseph. Here is a man who uh, was under a lot of stress, if you will. Uh, the governor has said it's time for a census, which means it's time to pay taxes. So you can imagine <coughs> how much fun that's going to be. But not only that, now he has to go back to his home place, the city of David, Bethlehem, which is where his people are from. Now, as you read in Matthew chapter 1, you read the genealogy of Jesus. And you see where Joseph, or excuse, yeah, Joseph belongs to the family of Abraham the family of Judah, the family of David, coming all the way through to the family of Zerubbabel. 
And so just 450 years before the days of Joseph, his people, his lineage, was of the king of Israel. And you can know that Joseph knew those genealogical tables, and Joseph knew where he belonged. He belonged in leadership over the entire nation. But the last 400 years have been kind of tough. As a matter of fact, and just instead of Joseph being king, now he's a carpenter. And that idea of a carpenter in our modern day would translate to a day laborer. He's somebody out making more or less minimum wage. He's someone who, as we see with the sacrifice in the temple after the birth of Jesus, as he is offering just a turtle dove, he's a man who's in poverty. And so you can imagine what's going through Joseph's mind as he realizes where he should be and now where he's at. Now, he has to travel from his homeland, where he, he lives, all the way to Bethlehem. Now, as you look on a map and look at straight as it goes, that's 70 miles away. Jews that day used to not go through Samaria. They'd want to go through the Jordan Plain down to Bethlehem, outside of Jerusalem. And so that would be 90 miles. So here he is traveling for, let's see, us in Benton. Um, Clarksville is going to be 82 miles from here. So he is traveling from here to Clarksville on foot, and you can imagine how difficult of a journey that would be. And as he arrives, think about who Joseph is. This is his home place, if you will. This is his ancestral place. The people here are his cousins, second cousins, uncles, things such as that. But he arrives in Bethlehem, and there's not a house in the town that can take him in. There's nowhere that has room for him, even though he's among family. As a matter of fact, he even goes to the end, and the end is full, and they put him and his pregnant wife in the barn, if you will. It's more or less a cave, a place where the animals usually are, and that's where he has to stay. As you and I think about what Joseph is going through at this point, perhaps we can relate to it. For some people, holidays are tough. Sometimes we don't feel accepted or we don't feel like we fit in to our families. Sometimes because of divorce, sometimes because of separation, sometimes because of anger issues. Maybe we just don't get along with everybody and the holidays can be a difficult time. We read in our Bibles in Psalm chapter 34. And as we look at that passage, we see a passage which perhaps comforted Joseph. 34.18 tells us the Lord is close to those who are brokenhearted. And He is there for those who have been crushed in spirit. And so you can imagine the journey which Joseph has taken. And you can imagine what's going through his mind. But as we focus on Joseph, let's look at his wife, Mary. Now as you think about Mary... Uh, you realize what it is she's going through. When I first began preaching, I preached a sermon around Christmas and talked about Joseph and Mary and talked about Mary riding on a donkey. And somebody after services got a hold of me and corrected me. And they said, Mary never was on a donkey. That's not anywhere in there. It's a Christmas story, but it's not found in Scripture. Well, maybe she was on a donkey, maybe not. Donkeys were pretty common back in that day. But imagine being nine months pregnant and it's time to walk for 90 miles. Imagine knowing that you're going to have a baby in the next week or two and having to walk a four-mile journey. And as you enter around Jerusalem, around Bethlehem, there's mountains that you've got to crawl over. I looked on a weather app today. In Bethlehem, it is 52 degrees and clear. But usually the temperature is about the mid-30s. As you go through the Jordan Plain, usually... During that time, it's in the mid-30s, and it rains. That's the rainy season. So you can imagine walking, nine months pregnant, walking with it being cold and with it raining, walking and realizing there's really not a lot of people who are going to be anxious to see you. As a matter of fact, there may not even be a place to stay. In your minds, go through what Mary is thinking about. You think she was mad at God? God, why would you make me pregnant in the winter? <laughs> why couldn't we do this during the summer? You think she was mad at Joseph? 
Why could I not be with one of the boys who grew up in Judea rather than having go back to Jerusalem and make this long journey? You think she was mad at the government? Why do we really have to do a census right now when all these things else are going on? There's sometimes in the holiday seasons where we're filled with grief and we're filled with questions and perhaps we're filled with a little bit of anger. A lot of people around us have passed away. And because of that, there's going to be some empty seats around the holiday table. A lot of us are enduring economic stress because of the pandemic and because of the economy. And sometimes as we feel this stress to give gifts and receive gifts, when we feel this stress to have big meals and to make big journeys, sometimes that causes a little bit of anger and a little bit of stress. Sometimes we look at the world and perhaps the election didn't go the way we wanted. Perhaps the news media has brought out things which make us to be kind of filled with stress. Mary very likely feels much like many people do today. Wondering why God would do the things he does in the way that he did. Psalm 46 and verse 1 tells us, That no matter where we are or what we're facing, God is our refuge and strength. And He is our present help in times of trouble. 1 Peter 5 and verse 7 tells us to cast our cares upon Him because God cares for us. There's sometimes we don't understand why God does the things that He does. And there's sometimes that you and I would like to sit in God's seat and correct God and fix God. And change God. But we receive the promise that God's with us. That God will take care of us. And that God will see us through everything that we endure. And so you can imagine Joseph. And you can imagine Mary as they journey to Bethlehem. As they travel to this place and what's going through their minds. And what's going through everything that it is that they're enduring. And then the time comes, and Jesus comes to this world. And as we think about Jesus, we see the very purpose of his life and his name. We read in the book of Matthew that his name will be Emmanuel, which means God with us. We see that his name shall be Christ, which means anointed. We see that his name is Joshua, Yesu. The one named after the Old Testament Joshua, which will be the one who redeems Israel. Now, the Greek version of that name Joshua will be Jesus. And as you and I look at Jesus, what I want us to focus on is the journey that he made. He didn't just come from Judea, which was 90 miles away. He didn't come just across town. But he left the splendor of heaven. He came down from the presence of God, and he lived among men. We read in Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 5, that our attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, being found in appearance as a man. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death. Even the death that would be on the cross. Now imagine with me, if you will, this aspect of the journey of Jesus. If you and I were to leave heaven, we would probably want to be born in the family of a great philosopher. Or the family of an emperor. Or the family of someone who would be famous, at least wealthy. And yet here is Jesus. Being born in a manger. Being laid in a trough usually reserved for animals. Here is Jesus growing up in a poor, hard-scrabble family. Here is Jesus living a life of rejection. Living a life of people who turn against him. Living a life where he's hungry. Living a life where he is betrayed. Giving himself up to die on a cross. Why? Luke chapter 19 and verse 10 says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. 
Jesus made the longest, greatest journey that anyone ever has, leaving the joy of heaven and living upon this earth. Why? John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish, but he should have everlasting life. But that's not the end of the journey of Jesus. Because we see not only did Jesus come to this world to be born, come to this world to show us how to live, come to this world to die for our sins, but Jesus, after three days, was raised from the grave. Now, that's very significant. You and I as Christians oftentimes will have a cross on our necklace. We'll have a building that has a cross on the steeple. And Christianity is usually represented by a cross. But the greater representation of Christianity is not just the cross. It's an empty tomb. That's what makes it special. Going all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, we see where Adam and Eve sinned against God. And because they sinned against God, they were separated from Him, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. And so we see because of that sin, there began to be hurt. There began to be struggle. There began to be sweat. There began to be guilt and regret. And eventually, through Adam, there began to be death. People are separated from those they love because of death and because of sin. Now, as we leave the building today, you can look down the road over here and you'll see a cemetery. And that cemetery is filled with good, faithful Christian members. And just about any way that you travel from here, you'll pass by a cemetery which is filled with family. You'll pass a cemetery in which brings back memories of good people who have been there. Grief hurts because death hurts. What makes Christianity awesome is the fact of the resurrection. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And as we look here, notice what Paul says. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, in which you receive, in which you also stand, by which you are saved, if you hold fast to that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. Now look at verse 3. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and He was buried, and He was raised on the third day, according to to the scriptures. Now skip down, if you will, to verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits for those who have fallen asleep. For by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. Verse 22. For as in Adam all died, even so in Christ shall all people be made alive. What's awesome about that empty tomb is the promise that we receive. Many times we feel like death is the end. If you look at a tombstone and it'll give the date of the birth and it'll give the date of the death and there is a hyphen between the two. And we see that as the beginning and we see that as the end. But it's not. Just as Christ rose from the grave, there's coming a day in which every single person shall rise from the grave. The Bible teaches clearly that there will be a physical resurrection. Now, what that will be like, we're not sure. If you're wanting to study that a little bit more, look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, and read through 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But we do know that the dead shall be raised. Now, there had been resurrections in the past. Elijah had raised up a widow's son. And there had been other resurrections through the Old Testament. Jesus brought back to life Lazarus and the widow of Nain's son and different people. But every one of those people, even though they came back to life, they eventually died. Jesus, when he rose, rose never to die again. 
And as he is the first fruit, you and I shall follow him. And everyone shall either meet the Lord when he returns, or we shall rise from the grave to meet him in the air. The Thessalonian writer says, comfort one another with these words. And so if you deal with grief today, if you deal with sorrow today, if you deal with a tear as you have those memories today, no, it's not the end. We shall be together again. And so it's amazing to see how this changes our life. As Paul was able to write in Philippians chapter 1, For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. But we see that's not the end of the journey of Jesus. For now we go to the ascension. And as you and I read about Jesus in Acts chapter 1, we see where he tells the apostles about how they need to preach the gospel. And then we see that he is caught up in the air and the angels appear among the apostles. And they, you know, you can imagine what it'd be like. They say, what are y'all looking at? The Lord whom you saw leave shall come back in the exact same way. But now he's at the right hand of God. Why is it important to think about the ascension of Jesus? It's because, first and foremost, it shows us his authority. The person at the right hand of the king has the same power as the king. And so, therefore, you see where Jesus is able to say in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, all authority on heaven and earth has been given unto me. Decades later, John, in exile on the Isle of Patmos, thinking about all of his friends, the apostles who had died a martyr's death, wondering what his future held, and being worried about the church that he loved so much, the church of Ephesus, receives a vision, an apocalypse, the revelation, a vision of his best friend, Jesus. And as he begins to see that vision, he sees in Revelation 1.8 where that writing comes forth, and he says, I am the beginning and the end, the one who was, who is, who is to come. I am, Jesus says, the Lord God Almighty. Jesus made a journey so that he could have authority. So he could, as an expert, tell us the way in which we need to go. But that's not the only reason why the ascension is important. We read in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1 that we now have a high priest who is seated at the right hand of God to make intercession for us. You and I as members of the Lord's church have an opportunity to pray. And when we pray through the name of the Lord, we have a direct line of communication to God. And so our journey on this earth may be difficult. And while our journey on this earth may be hard, we have one who loves us. We have one who is there for us. We have one who will never leave us nor forsake us. He's at the right hand of God. And so you and I, In the journey of which we're making, not just this week, but in the journey of our life, can see what Jesus has done for every one of us. As we look at the journey of Joseph, enduring hard times, enduring rejection, we see the message of Jesus, that God will be with us. In the journey of Mary, filled with grief, filled with pain, filled with discomfort, we see that the Lord knows what we're going through and He is there for us. Whoever you may be, whatever it may be that you're going through today, know that the Lord has made a journey for you. And know that the Lord has a journey for you to be on. This morning, if the invitation applies to you, If you need to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ through the baptism for remission of sins, this is your opportunity. If you need the prayers of the Lord's church, this is your opportunity. If we can help you in any way, we ask that you come forward while we stand and while we sing.
Always appreciate Mark's lesson. Good lesson today, Mark. And he just commonly does that for us, so we are thankful for him. <clears throat> this time, we'd like to take a few moments to mention those who are needing prayers, asking for prayers. Uh, we certainly want to remember the family of Neil Haley, who passed away Thursday, and his funeral was yesterday, so let's keep that family in our prayers. Jerry Sales will have a medical procedure tomorrow at Neuro Neurosurgical Center in Indianapolis with the goal of alleviating his essential tremor. We hope that is a successful surgery. Pray for Jerry. Pamela Ross is back home and resting following surgery. Bob Hines had surgery on Thursday, and he is recuperating at home and doing well at this time. Uh, Nathan Hurdle had scans uh, this past Friday. Ashley Lyles had uh, scans this past week, and her scans were clear. So we are so thankful for that. Don Frick had a procedure on his back Friday at Mercy Health in Lourdes, at Lourdes, uh, Mercy Health or Lourdes. Uh, we hope Don has a quick recovery from that. Chester Uzzle is now at home and doing pretty good. Uh, he was not affected uh, too much by the COVID, but uh, Chester is still in, uh, not in real good health and probably does not need people to come by at this time. <clears throat> Dee Dee Guthrie's husband, Barry, had a biopsy this week and is awaiting results. Bob Donnelly, Bob York's neighbor, was released from the hospital and is home resting. Uh, Debbie Nunley is now home following an extended stay in the hospital for COVID-19. <clears throat> Betty Crowley, that's uh, Shauna Burkeen's mom, had breast cancer surgery on Tuesday at Baptist Health. Doctors say everything went well and her, her lymph nodes are clear. And that is wonderful news. Um, um, Theresa Cotham is doing real well. She is in ICU at Marshall County Hospital and will be there for a few more days, but then will be moved to a regular room. So there's good news there. <clears throat> Jane Campbell has been sick this past week with severe abdominal pains, and uh, she is waiting to have tests scheduled and find out what's going on with her. Our daughter, Holly Webb, lives in Jackson, Tennessee, is dealing with a case of COVID. She is doing pretty good, but we ask for your prayers for her and for Jamie and Brooke and Brady that they don't uh, get the, the virus. We need to continue to remember Rhonda Ray, Mike Terry, that's Taylor Odom's stepfather, and he's dealing with COVID, and, uh, but he's doing much better now. We need to remember Estel Pirtle, Misty Campbell, and our homebound and shut-ins. <clears throat> if you would, let's bow and go to our Heavenly Father at this prayer at this time. Father, we are thankful for the opportunity <clears throat> that we have had to worship today. We're thankful for Mark's lesson. We're thankful that Jesus came into this world. We're thankful that he died and that he was resurrected from the grave and ascended to your throne in heaven. And Father, we know that gives us assurance that if we follow him we will be resurrected to life also father we pray for your blessings on this church we pray for strength to meet the trials of this life and we pray that you will keep us healthy during this pandemic At this time father we would like to bring the names of those mentioned before your throne those who are bereaving Father, we, we pray for those families who have lost loved ones. We know it's such a difficult time, and we pray that you will bless them. We pray for those mentioned who 
are in need of prayers that have had surgeries, that are dealing with the virus, that are recovering, that are in various health situations, Father. And we pray that you will look down upon them and that you will bless them and that they will, they will soon be able to return to their normal life. Father, we thank you for loving us and we thank you for caring for us. And Father, we pray that our faith may, and be, may be increased during this time of trial. We pray, Father, that we may learn to rely more on you every day. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for loving us. And we love you, Father. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. And amen. All right. have a few more announcements. Not too many, but a few here. Uh, the office will be closed uh, December the 23rd through the 25th for the holidays. Be sure to check your mailboxes in the foyer. There are lots of cards in those mailboxes. If you know somebody that's not here, um, take them to them. Or if you're listening, call into the office, come by and get them. Have one of the secretaries bring them to you. So a lot of mail. Uh, we'd like to thank everyone who donated to the Holiday Helpers. We were able to help several families uh, during this time because of your generosity. So we had to, that had to be done quite differently, but it, uh, they made it work. Uh, thank you for worshiping with us today in whatever manner you have chosen. I would like to give you just a little summary of numbers. We've probably not done this too much, but this morning we had 92, and I believe it's, uh, it's hard to see through this thing, but I think it was 143 there. And um, so I checked on live stream Facebook first service, and there were about 50 watching, and about 20, 15 to 20 at this service. So, you know, we're, we're well over 300, plus those that are listening on the radio and I know there's several that just listen on the radio because they told me that. And uh, so we, we're making it, folks. It's a tough time, but we are making it, and we are, I believe, remaining faithful. I believe a lot of these people watching on Facebook and live stream uh, probably are two or three on a device, too. So we have a good number, and we are so thankful for that. I have a card I'd like to read at this time from the Farmer family. It says, there are no words to express how thankful we are for all the acts of kindness shown during Larry's battle with cancer. While losing someone is never easy, having God's love and such a caring church family is such a blessing. And thank you, love, the Farmer family. concludes the announcements that I have. <clears throat> oh, um, I knew there was one more thing about that. Uh, Marlene said that the dishes that you brought for with food are on the table in the foyer, so pick up those dishes if you, uh, if you have some out there. We hope everyone has a great week. We hope everyone is safe. And we hope that we can soon be together again. But uh, as things go, we are doing the best we can, and I believe the Lord understands that. So may God bless you. Uh, Jerry, do you have a song? Yep, just one. I think the uh, balcony can go ahead and be dismissed, and uh, we'll be singing the, this song for dismissal. And uh,